you then could you share the your screen? Uh, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, today's seminar speaker is the uh, Professor Sohun Jung, uh, and he will talk about the Hubble selection of the weak scale. Okay. Thank you. Okay, just a moment. Okay. All right, so thank you for the invitation. It's always a great pleasure to give a talk at KIAS. Uh, so actually, as I look back, it's been more than 10 years since I first gave a talk at KIAS. And since then, I've given several seminars and conference talks in KIAS. And every time it was a uh, opportunity and excitement and also motivation to develop something new and give a new talk. And fortunately today, I hope I can give a, a relatively new direction of uh, research. So it's based on the paper that I posted on archive back in July uh, with my student Taehun Kim. Uh, it's a Hubble selection of the weak scale. It's a kind of a quantum cosmological mechanism to choose a weak scale in the uh, most of the universe. Um, okay, so let me get started. So let me start by giving you some background physics and characters. So before the discovery of the Higgs boson, it was a hypothetical spin zero particle responsible for electric symmetry breaking and masses of quarks and leptons. But actually nature has never shown us fundamental spin zero particles. So it was a big uh, puzzle or question whether fundamental spin zero particle really exists or not. And part of the reason was that the dimensional parameters of the spin zero particles, for example, the mass, are very sensitive to the highest cutoff scales of a theory through the quantum correction. So it's very hard to make a very light fundamental spin zero particles, but the observed weak scale is much lighter than, much smaller than the Planck scale, which is presumably the cutoff of the standard model. But on the other hand, Besides from the observation of the weak scale, there also have been arguments, theoretical arguments in favor of light Higgs boson. And most remarkable and uh, strongest one is due to the unitarity of standard model. So if the standard model of a particle physics uh, is to be a consistent theory, then it has to satisfy the unitarity and light Higgs boson is required for that. So if the standard model doesn't have light Higgs boson, then unitarity is broken at some low energy scale. So it's not a consistent theory yet anymore. So through these kind of diagrams, Higgs boson restores the unitarity of the standard model. And until the discovery of the Higgs boson, this was the most remarkable and strongest argument in favor of the light Higgs boson. And indeed in 2011, the light Higgs boson was discovered so of course there was a great triumph of theory and experiment, but that was not the end of the story, of course, and that accompanied deeper problems. So most of all, the weak Planck hierarchy problem became a real problem. So it has to be solved in some way. In the quantum field theory framework, the weak Planck hierarchy is a quantum unstable. So there has to be some explanation and that became a real one, not a hypothetical one anymore. And more relevantly and more surprisingly, the observed Higgs mass value 126 GeV combined with other standard model parameters happened to imply the existence of, an, existence of an, another degenerate vacuum just near the Planck scale. So it didn't have to be that way. And this statement contains one and a half coincidences actually. So one is that the degenerate vacuum exists. And the other is that at the Planck scale, not a random scale, but at the Planck scale, okay? So that means that our electroweak vacuum or our universe is double critical or metastable, right? So if we just disappear or die away just tomorrow, it's not surprising anymore. And that also means that our vacuum is double critical to both zero and Planck scale. 
When the Higgs value is zero, we have an electroweak symmetry breaking, so phase transition. So that's a critical point. But also when the Higgs value or Higgs mass scale is Planck scale, we have another degenerate vacuum a little bit far away in the energy scale. So our vacuum may have a first order phase transition to another deeper vacuum. So Planck scale can be thought of as another uh, critical point in the energy scale. Okay. So our vacuum and our universe may live near to some critical point. Actually, a few years before this Higgs discovery, such a thought uh, in that our universe may live near the critical point was brought up by several theorists. And another uh, example of the near criticality was the dark energy. And we know that dark energy is observed to be very, very small and close to zero. And whether it's given by vacuum fluctuations or by some scalar field value in the quintessence framework, it's hierarchy with the Planck scale, which is, a, which is also the uh, cutoff scale, is much, much more severe than the weak Planck hierarchy problem, right? If it's solved or explained by dynamical or symmetrical reason, zero could be thought of as the supersymmetry limit. But if supersymmetry explained the zero or very small dark energy, the SUSY breaking had to be around the dark energy scale, which is milli electron volt, and SUSY particles had to be around there, but we haven't seen them. So such a symmetry explanation is unlikely for the dark energy. But actually zero is also the boundary between two different phases. In this case, accelerated and decelerated expansions. So we can also say that dark energy is very close to zero and we live near the critical line between uh, accelerated and decelerated expansion. So question can be why the dark energy is so close to the critical point, not why dark energy is very small. So Judy Che and his company based on these observations and argued that we may live near some critical line and such near critical behavior may be prevalent in standard model and may have some universal meanings to scale hierarchies. So scale hierarchy is not just due to the symmetry uh, that guarantees the cancellation of the dangerous quantum corrections, but may due to some critical behavior. And as an aside, in the similar time, Arkani Hamed, Delgado, and Judice also argued that thermal dark matter primary space can also be thought to be near critical. Okay. So 2006 was about the time when the direct detection of WIMP is about to close. I mean, the parameter space is about to close. So we need to have some fine tuning in the parameter space and WIMP miracle uh, didn't seem to be a natural consequence of the uh, theory or weak scale theories. Of course, this case, the near critical doesn't mean that uh, phase transition, but, but may just be the fine tuning of some parameters. But anyway, all these kinds of observations may say that our universe uh, live near some critical point. Ah, so Professor Dong Hui Jung, do you have a question? Yeah, hello. I, I, uh, I have a question. I don't know if it's how, how critical it is to your okay. main main presentation, mm -hmm. but so the statement that uh, dark energy of zero or cosmological constant of being zero is a critical point between acceleration and deceleration is only true when we don't have any matter, right? If you have some amount of matter, uh -huh. acceleration or deceleration, as a critical point has some finite value of lambda, so. That's right, just, oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. And also curvature, right? Right, so oh, that's, that's that was right. my comment. Ah, oh, that's right. That that's a good comment. I never thought that way. Yeah. So matter density, curvature density is much smaller than the critical density. So naively, zero or just near the zero is a, a critical point. But but yeah, that that's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Thank you for the comment. Thanks. All right, so near criticality may be prevalent and self-organized criticality may be a, a relevant phenomena uh, 
uh, in the standard model. Um, one of the familiar example of the self-organized criticality is the sand piling. Uh, they always make a critical angle. If you pour more sands, uh, avalanche occurs and they go back to a uh, critical angle, right? So there is some physics and mechanism uh, that makes the sand piling always at the critical angle. So that's called the self-organized criticality. So critical point is an attractor point in this kind of setup. So if we think that the Higgs mass is a result of some self-organized criticality, the question is not why is the Higgs mass is so small, but the question is why is the Higgs mass so close to some critical point? Okay. So this kind of uh, thought has been developed recently by Judy Chen, Maclo, Yu, and also Justin Curry in a cosmological setup. And in this point of view, a more relevant and specific questions could be what criticality is relevant to the weak scale and how to realize the self-organized criticality in the standard model. For example, what properties does criticality have and can it be used to, the, uh, to realize the self-organized criticality? Right. There might be various answers. I, I don't know many of them, but uh, the mechanism I'm going to use today is the quantum-driven so-called Hubble selection. So during the inflationary evolution of the universe, quantum fluctuations become essential part, and they see the structure of the universe, as we all know. So if there were no any quantum fluctuations, our universe would have been completely uniform and isotropic, so no structures would have formed. But quantum fluctuations during inflation become stretched and became classical, and they became the seed of the structure. So all the inhomogeneities that we see is basically due to the quantum fluctuations uh, during the inflation. So during inflation, quantum fluctuation became an essential role. And the relevant part of this talk is that quantum fluctuation can occasionally take us to the regime, which is inaccessible classically. Okay. And Albeit rarely, that quantum fluctuation can dominate the evolution of universe afterwards. And that's called the Hubble selection. And the character that is Hubble selected will be the criticality in this talk. So by taking an analogy with the uh, Darwin's natural selection, the random mutation corresponds to the quantum fluctuation. And some of the random mutations survive under natural selection because that's uh, better for the survival. And quantum fluctuation sometimes is Hubble selected because that's related to the criticality as I will describe in this talk today. Okay. And also we're gonna think about so-called uh, uh, some kind of statistical ensemble. And we're gonna talk about the probability distribution of the Higgs VAB or Higgs mass parameter, okay? because there will be a large number of Hubble patches and each Hubble patches will be causally disconnected. And each Hubble patch will have its own theory parameters, which is determined and varied by scalar field values. And scalar field is not just constant all over the universe, but it has a many different Fourier modes and long wave modes will be distributed across the Hubble patches. So their value and distribution will determine and determine the values and the variation of the theory parameters among the Hubble patches, okay? So for example, here, each small circle is the Hubble patches, radius is about Hubble radius. So different Hubble patches are all somewhat causally disconnected. And we have some scalar field mode here. In one of the Hubble patch, this scalar field contributes slightly negative contribution. But in the neighborhood Hubble patches, it contributes positively. So different patches can have different theory parameters, causally disconnected, and exponentially large number of Hubble patches. So we can consider those Hubble patches as a statistical ensemble, and we can talk about the probability distribution of some theory parameter. So in this setup, our goal is to realize a common weak scale in the majority of the Hubble patches irrespective of initial distribution. So inflationary evolution 
will make most of the Hubble patches to have the correct weak scale independent of the initial conditions. And for that mechanism, the, the fact that the weak scale could be near critical will play a crucial role. All right. And then criticality is related to the quantum phase transition in my talk. So quantum phase transition is different from the usual finite temperature phase transition. So it's a zero temperature phase transition. And it's a phase transition, not as a function of temperature, but as a function of some theory parameter. So as theory parameter is varied, at some point, theory moves into a different phase. That's called the quantum phase transition. And in our case, some scalar field values will evolve. And as some scalar field value, theory moves into a different phase. Okay. So here's a, one a prototypical example. So we have a, a, a quadratic potential and two degenerate minimum, and that determines spin up or spin down. Okay. One vacuum is spin up, the other is spin down. But if we apply uh, external B field, Due to the B dot S interaction, one of the vacuum aligned parallel with the magnetic field has a higher potential energy and the other spin has a negative potential energy. So we, be, we have a, a non-degenerate vacuum. As we increase the external B field strength, at some point, the higher energy vacuum became classically unstable. So it will roll down to this lower energy vacuum. That means all the spins flips to the uh, lower energy spin direction. And that makes a phase transition, not as a function of temperature, but as a function of external B field. So this is one typical example of the quantum phase transition. So we're going to utilize a similar mechanism. And not all quantum phase transition may be very useful, but first order quantum phase transition will be useful because that exhibits it discontinuities across the critical point, such as in the order parameters or some related properties. So discrete discontinuity of some theory parameter or observables may provide a sharp selection rule. That's why first order quantum phase transition may be useful. Okay. And that's also the one of the mechanism that Judy Chen, Maculo, you in the recent paper utilized. Okay. And I'm gonna show that QCD sector may contain relevant quantum critical points as some Higgs lab. Okay. All right, so that was all about the background physics and relevant characters. Now I'm gonna start by describing Hubble selection mechanism in detail. And I'm gonna explore QCD quantum critical points that may be relevant to the Higgs lab. And then I'm going to uh, introduce a model for the weak scale criticality that utilizes Hubble selection mechanism and QCD critical points. And then I'm going to talk about the naturalness of the uh, weak scale criticality. Okay. So any questions so far? All right, maybe I can move on. So as I said, scalar field value evolution during the inflation is a relevant uh, physics. So during inflation, scalar field value is subject to two opposing forces. One is the usual classical rolling. Uh, the field value always tends to roll down to the bottom of a potential. Right? So that classical rolling is given by potential slope divided by Hubble friction. And another is the quantum fluctuation. In each Hubble time, it gets a random contribution of order h in either sign, positive or negative, right? So when, can I ask a question? Yeah. So here you are mentioning a scalar field. You, is, is this an inflaton or just a other um, scalar? Uh, it, could be, it could be inflaton, but in our setup, it's not inflaton. It, it, it's, it's like relaxion, but quantum driven relaxion. Okay, here, so V is not the inflaton potential, it's potential for phi. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Phi is not in flaton, but, okay. but in general, it could be in flaton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in our scenario, it's not in flaton. So you, you mentioned also the random walk of the Hubble. Um, mm -hmm. could, could you elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, 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 I'm gonna do that. So in each Hubble time, 
this color field value phi gets a random contribution of order h. The probability distribution is a Gaussian, but the width is h because in each Hubble time, new small quantum fluctuation mode was stretched beyond the horizon and they become frozen because they are out of causal connect and they have a, a size about h, either sign, right? And smaller Fourier modes in each Hubble patch will have many oscillations, so they will be averaged out. But long Fourier modes will have a more or less constant contribution to each Hubble patch, so they do contribute to the total field value. And in each Hubble time, new smaller free modes become stretched out to the horizon, so they contribute additionally uh, to the scalar field value. And that's a random value of order h, or h over 2 pi, Hawking temperature. OK. OK, so here h is um, oh, Hubble constant, sorry. OK, so essentially governed by inflaton. Uh, yeah, that's right. OK. That's right. Yeah. It's got... Yep, so phi is not in flatton. It contributes a very small contribution to the Hubble constant. So we have two contributions, but of course, quantum fluctuations are symmetric. It could make phi larger or smaller by equal probability. So if we focus Someone on- Someone can ask questions, sorry. Yeah. But then you, you require phi to be slowly rolling. Yeah, that's right. Even though right. phi that's is not in flatton. Okay, that's, that's right, yeah, very slowly rolling. So if we focus on each Hubble patch, scalar field value evolution will be stochastic because we have a random walk, but in average, it will always roll down to the bottom of the potential because quantum fluctuation is just symmetry, but classical rolling is always tend to be the, uh, tend to the uh, bottom of a potential, okay? That's one thing. And also different patches would take different patches, a different trajectory because quantum fluctuation will be different among Hubble patches, as also shown here, right? In this patch, this quantum fluctuation gives negative contribution, but in neighboring, neighboring Hubble patches, it gives a positive contribution. Okay. So in each Hubble patch, it always rolls down or by stochastic motion, but different patches would take different trajectory. So we will think about global field value distribution. So different patches will have slightly different color field value, and evolution. At certain time, uh, we can think about such global distribution. And even, with, even if we started with the same value in all Hubble patches, it will be dispersed with time because quantum fluctuations are different among different Hubble patches. So variance is proportional to the time or the number of e-folding ht. And in each Hubble time, we get h over two pi squared. So Hubble temperature is clear. Okay. So that's one behavior of the global distribution, but more relevantly and most importantly, different Hubble patches will have slightly different Hubble rate because uh, phi C field value is slightly different. Right? And we have a uh, new Hubble patches uh, produced in each Hubble time. And because different Hubble patches will have different Hubble rate, uh, there will be more number of new Hubble patches will be produced when the uh, phi C is at a higher potential region rather than in the lower potential region. So that provides a bias toward the higher potential energy. So although quantum fluctuations were symmetry, when sometimes it happens to be at the higher potential region that has a slightly larger Hubble rate, so there will be a more number of Hubble patches with that scalar field value, which is at the higher potential region. So that provides a bias. And in literature, that's called the Hubble volume effect. Okay. So this could be the global field distribution, but in some Hubble patches, we'll have a larger Hubble rate and some have a lower Hubble rate. And as, we, as time goes on, there will be more number of Hubble patches with this value will be produced than these Hubble patches. So such a global distribution evolution, time evolution is determined by so-called the volume weighted focal Planck equation, FPV equation, determined by three terms. 
So first two terms are usual classical and quantum rolling. First derivative is a classical rolling. It's always going down to the bottom of a potential, so V prime. And second derivative is symmetry, right? So that's a quantum fluctuation. And last term is the Hubble volume effect. It's determined by the Hubble rate variation, delta H, within the distribution. So if the distribution were delta function, there were no any bias, all the Hubble patches have the same Hubble rate. So we don't have this Hubble volume effect, but diffusion is necessary because quantum fluctuation is different in different Hubble patches. And at some point, width becomes large enough, delta H becomes large enough, and Hubble volume effect becomes dominant. And this peak of the distribution may climb up the potential. So that's a non-trivial behavior that might be Hubble selective, random mutation, necessary random mutation. Uh, so when, right. yeah. I have another question. So yeah. here, um, it seems you allow the spatial um, difference in the field value of phi. That's right. Um, That's right. And, and, and that contribute to the spatial difference in Hubble. That's right. Okay. That's right. So do you take the, the hooking temperature for the mass of the, the fine field? So sorry, hooking temperature for the- Oh okay. yeah, you have the hooking temperature due to the um, Hubble. Due and to then the fine has dynamics um, associated with that mass, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but in your equation, I, I don't see the mass um, mass would be contained in potential. Um, so this is the potential of the phi. Yeah, but in, in, in phi, um, due to the Hubble temperature, you have a um, correction due to the Hubble. Ah, mass of the phi is corrected by Hubble temperature, you mean? That's right, yeah. Ah. Just uh, like the finite temperature effect. Ah, okay, good question. Um, so we haven't used the effective mass terminology. Okay. I don't know in detail. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I don't know, but- there, Yeah, there um, here is another, uh, yeah, so another question is about the V uh, prime. Mm -hmm. so v prime is the um, V uh, partial derivative of V with respect to phi. Right, right that's right. Slope of the potential. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But you allow the spatial variation of phi. Spatial variation. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, how can I see um, that effect in this equation? Ah, that's only included in delta H. Oh, uh, okay, delta H. Yeah. So we are not actually taking the continuous derivative in the space, but we take the Hubble patches have slightly different values somewhat discontinuously. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We are ignoring the smooth transition between them. Okay, okay, please go on. Mm -hmm. Right, so Hubble selection means that the global field distribution may climb up. Okay, so that Hubble volume effect makes the patch with largest Hubble ray will be Hubble selected, as I just described. So let me solve the Fokker-Planck FPV equation and see some characteristic features. So in the linear regime of a potential, of course, potential may have a, a, a complicated shape and boundary, but focus on a small intermediate regime. Then we can solve FPV analytically and the solution, the global field value distribution in time is given by Gaussian distribution. So if we start with the Gaussian distribution, then it will remain so for all time. The width of the Gaussian distribution is again given by Hawking temperature square times number of E-folding. And the peak location first given by the classical rolling down, phi C dot is minus uh, B prime, so it's negative. So it's always going down to the bottom of a potential. And the other contribution is due to the Hubble volume effect variation of the delta H times the width square, right? If the width were small, there wouldn't be any uh, Hubble volume effect. But as the width grows, we have a larger and larger Hubble bias. 
So we have a larger Hubble volume effect. So peak location may not always goes down, but at some large width case, we have a positive movement of the peak. So that happens when the width is a Planckian. So when we equal these two contribution, then we get this result. And irrespective of the potential shape or potential slope, when the width is about the Planckian, then Hubble selection always starts to operate and global distribution always climbs up the potential. And being that it's a Planckian means it's a quantum nature. Okay. So this simple solution means that in order for the Hubble selection to start the operation, it always takes some time to develop width, so field range two, and also Planckian width for Hubble selection. It does not start right away uh, after the inflation starts. Okay. So here's a characteristic behavior uh, of the equilibrium distribution. So once Hubble selection starts to operate, global distribution climbs up and moves up toward the highest point of the potential. So critical point could be the highest, highest, uh, highest, point, highest potential energy point because that's the boundary between two different phases. In one phase, energy was large and the other phase, energy is small and there's a discontinuity and energy drops suddenly at the critical point. So the critical point could be the attractor of the Hubble selection mechanism. Okay. And distribution starts climb up toward the highest point. And at some point it has to make some equilibrium because Hubble patches that cross the critical point will have a smaller Hubble rate. So it's out of Hubble selection. So it has to make some equilibrium near some critical point. Okay. But actually the flatter the potential, the closer to the critical point. So these blue are equilibrium distribution, okay? So the flatter the potential, the equilibrium position is closer to the critical point. That's one conclusion. And the position of the peak cannot be closer than the M Planck in, in the field space distance. That also reflects the uncertainty principle. And the equilibrium width of a distribution is always M Planck. If the width is larger than M Planck, then we have a stronger Hubble, uh, Hubble volume effect, right? Hubble volume effect starts to operate when the width was M Planck. But if the width is larger, Hubble volume effect is larger. So it, it has to move up. So equilibrium distribution always makes M Planckian width. Okay. But here, for example, so this is the closest to the critical point. But if we make the potential even flatter, then it cannot be closer to the critical point. So rather, the width of the uh, distribution actually dispersed. And eventually, if we make the potential completely flat, the distribution has to be completely uniform, spread all over the potential regime. So that makes sense, right? So these are equilibrium uh, distribution. Ah, and also, if the potential is uh, steep enough, then equilibrium distribution forms just near the bottom of a potential. So it's essentially like classical distribution, okay? So energy provided by quantum fluctuation, Hava over two pi to the four, has to be localized within the distribution. So that's basic uh, arguments in, in estimating the width, okay? So these are the mechanisms developed recently by these two papers. All right, now <clears throat> I said it takes some time and field range in order for the Hubble selection to start operation. And the number of E-folding until it starts climbing is actually larger than the Decider entropy bound of the inflation. So that means eternal inflation is necessary for Hubble selection. It requires so long time, so finite inflation does not work with the Hubble selection. Then the question is, how do we define a probability distribution? Because we have an infinite number of patches, so we cannot normalize the distribution. But practically, the distribution can be defined only among Hubble patches that have already reached reheating. 
because those are the universe that will evolve into something like our own. Right? And in each time, there will be exponentially more number of patches will reach reheating, right? So all, among all, all the Hubble patches that have reached reheating, latest one will dominate in number. So we can focus on the stationary states or late time equilibrium distribution of the Fokker Planck uh, evolution. Okay. So these are the basic Hubble selection mechanism in the quantum inflationary mechanism. Now I'm gonna talk about the QCD quantum critical points. Any questions so far? Uh, so can yeah. you compare um, the potential of phi and the influx and potential? Because you allow the uh, Planck, almost Planck scale width in the field. That's right. I guess um, you may have a large energy contribution to the um, inflaton. So I, I wonder if you um, are still compatible with the uh, conventional inflation scenario. Ah, very, very crucial question. That's right. So the effect of the phi to the inflation or inflaton sector has to be small enough. Mm -hmm. We can either make the coupling very small Mm -hmm. And absolute energy scale very small. Okay. Yeah. So I think so here. I so by, by by assuming so, probably you, you already assumed the mass of the phi should be tiny, tiny, small. Yeah, that's right. So we need very flat potential. Okay. Otherwise, Hubble selection quantum effects is not dominant anymore. All right, so now I'm going to explore QCD uh, critical points. Uh, the starting point is that in the standard model, if the strange quark were slightly lighter, then QCD chiral transition could have been first order. So it's thought to be that QCD chiral transition was second order, but it's not uh, strictly confirmed yet. Theory calculation involves non perturbative QCD. So we need to use lattice calculation, but state-of-art lattice calculation is not really good enough to tell something yet. Okay, so here's a phase diagram in the plane of up and down quark mass and the strange quark mass. And it's thought to be that our standard model lives here close to the critical line. If the strange quark was slightly lighter, it could have been first order, but now it's heavy enough so that it's a second order. So for two life labor, there is no any IR stable fixed point. So it's thought to be the first order, but there is a quadratic instanton contribution uh, composed of these two life labors. And because it's a quadratic term, that can make it phase transition second order. Okay. Of course, it could still be first order depending on the relative size, but there's a possibility that uh, the phase transition is second order. But for three life flavors, instant contribution is now trilinear, all done under uh, uh, parity flip. And that can alone can make it first order. So that's a very basic argument why, we why if we have a light strange quark, we can have a first order rather than second order. Okay. And all these are finite temperature arguments, but this also may imply that zero temperature QCD phase structure may be complex and that may contain quantum critical points, right? But actually all those have never been explored yet. Even standard model parameter space has not been confirmed very strongly yet, okay? So instead of doing a state-of-art lattice calculation, we use linear sigma model, which is very similar to landau ginzburg or Higgs mechanism, to just explore the QCD vacuum structure at zero temperature. This is of course a very big approximation, but we're gonna take this as a first step. And we're gonna also assume three life flavors, four, five, six, it's just too much for us now. So linear sigma model potential for the meson field, sigma, sigma is the QQ bar combination, composite field have essentially five terms. They are given by SUNF times SUNF flavor symmetry. 
And meson condensation is an older parameter for the symmetry breaking or QCD chiral symmetry breaking. Okay, so it's just essentially the Higgs mechanism. Of course, yeah, that's why LSM is relatively easy to handle uh, for people like me. Okay. And importantly, this simple linear sigma model with three life flavor contains all necessary features for quantum critical point. Again, back to this figure. Uh, so three terms in the first line are usual mass terms and quartic potential terms. Okay. But two terms in the second line can introduce non-trivial phase structure and critical point. C is the cubic instant on interaction. So determinant sigma is the instant on interaction, but we have a three flavor. So the determin determinant term provides a cubic uh, potential of the sigma that provides a relevant bias uh, between the left and right and vacuum. Okay. And also we have a linear term, which is the meson mass contribution. So that has a linear Higgs valve dependence and that's very analogous to external B field in this ferromagnetic example that I have described. If you have an external B field in the Lagrangian, we have B dot S contribution, and one of the spin directions is preferred than the other. Okay. So this linear term, which is the meson mass, provides the same bias between two vacuum. Of course, in this case, sigma is a, uh, contains 18 real scalar field. So field space is 18 dimensional, not just one dimensional. So very complicated, the basic feature is the same. We have a degenerate vacua when H is was zero, but if we increase the H, there, there is a bias. And at some point of the H, higher energy vacuum becomes unstable. And H in this case is the Higgs bar. So we have all the necessary ingredients. So we have indeed scanned all 18 sigma field space plus four parameter space. Four is mu, or maybe five, uh, yeah, mu lambda one, lambda two C, and we vary the H. Okay. So in this larger parameter space, fortunately and surprisingly, we have successfully found the range of consistent parameter space. That must have coexisting vacua when the Higgs valve is zero, but at some large Higgs valve, higher energy vacuum becomes classically unstable. And this Higgs valve is the critical point. And also meson spectrum has to be consistent with the observation when the Higgs valve is electroweak scale and chi square over degree of freedom is of order three, very good agreement. And one of the main reasons for such a good agreement is that scalar mesons are not well constrained. Right, pseudo scalars are dictated by symmetries, so they have a good theory predictions. But scalar mesons are not dictated by symmetries, so their theory predictions are sensitive to additional contributions, quantum contribution, model dependence. So it's not well constrained yet. So that's one reason why we could uh, make the meson spectrum consistent enough. And this kind of uh, coexisting vacua and first order transition feature is pretty generic, but we're gonna take the 20 MeV as the benchmark uh, uh, benchmark uh, critical point. Okay. But any value between zero and lambda QCD is possible. Okay, so this is the phase diagram. As a function of Higgs valve, higher energy vacuum, which preserved the SU3L times SU2R, slightly evolved, and at some point, it becomes classically unstable through some field direction. And lower energy vacuum, which is the true QCD vacuum today, uh, is stable, stable, stable until today. Okay. All right, now we have to talk about a model for the weak scale criticality. So previously, I just said that we're gonna vary the Higgs bath by hand, but now we're gonna come up with the model uh, where during the inflation, Higgs valve is varied a function of some underlying mechanism. So such you, a mechanism yeah. Uh, before you go to the weak scale criticality uh, in this uh, page 19. Yeah. 
Uh, have you have you tried uh, uh, without without the current pong mass term? Current is it, yeah, yeah, yeah. that term? Is it is it crucial to have that in your? Yeah, it's crucial to have this. Uh, so you are you are feeding you are feeding the uh, SU three U three cross U three linear sigma model to the hadronic. On top of the hadron spectra, right? Exactly. Mm. So, what, what do you mean by crucial? For for what? Ah, uh, okay. So, I, I, so you are really uh, uh, considering here real QCD. Ah, yeah. So, in this sense, consistent with meson spectrum, we take the parameter consistent with the real QCD, mm -hmm. but we just vary the Higgs bad quark mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So when the Higgs verb is one, this verb is one, we have a consistent meson spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And crucial feature is that at some finite Higgs verb, we have a critical behavior. So when the Higgs verb was zero, we need to have two vacuum separated by a barrier. But at some finite Higgs verb, higher energy vacuum becomes unstable. So of course, there are some parameter space where when the Higgs verb was zero, we have only this true vacuum. So that's a majority of parameter space. But there's also another kind of solution where when the Higgs verb was zero, two vacuum, but at some finite Higgs verb, higher energy vacuum disappears. So maybe this has not been studied in detail in literature. And it's a kind of a new, new finding. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Higgs verb scanning is provided by the relaxion. So usual classical relaxion given by Peter Graham at all. It's just taken, copied here. But evolution of the phi, its global field distribution is determined by the Hubble selection. So it actually climbs up the potential rather than rolling down the potential in all the Hubble patches, right? And its global distribution makes an equilibrium near critical point, which is the critical point of the QCD that we just found. Then at the time of reheating, most of the Hubble patches will have the Higgs fab near this critical point, which is about order 10 MeV near lambda QCD. Okay, and happen to be that lambda QCD is near to the uh, weak scale and is small by dimensional transmutation. Okay, so potential is just the usual relaxion potential. V5 is axion potential, long field range, and VH uh, has a usual contribution and the coupling to the relaxion. So Higgs mass is scanned by the evolution of the relaxion field value. Okay. Now, near the QCD critical point, we have to find the consistency condition uh, for the selection of the critical point. So that consistency condition is that total potential energy has to be maximum near the critical point. We have three potential contribution. One is the relaxion, one is the Higgs potential, one is the sigma field contribution. Of course, there's an inflaton, but it's independent on the relaxion, right? So as a function of relaxion field value, we have those three contribution. And only the relaxion contribution is positive with the relaxion field value. But Higgs potential and sigma potential has a slightly negative contribution. So we have a competition. But near the critical line here, it has to be maximum, as shown here. And after drop, relaxion potential still grows with the phi build value, but Higgs potential drops quickly. So after a while, it grows slowly and then drops quickly due to the Higgs potential contribution. But this growth due to the V phi should not compensate this lambda QCD scale energy drop at the critical line. So again, this energy, sharp energy drop is given by this energy difference. And that sharp drop will provide the sharp selection rule around here, right? 
Hubble patches that have Higgs strap slightly above here, Hubble rate is very small compared to the Hubble patches here. So they are out of Hubble selection. So we have some consistency condition for that. And also Higgs and Sigma should not have much quantum fluctuation. So they must uh, reside near the bottom of a potential. So Hubble constant has to be smaller than the Higgs graph. And also as Song -Chan, Professor Songchan Park has mentioned, relaxion should not com uh, dominate the inflaton dynamics. So relaxion potential has to be smaller than the total inflation of vacuum energy. So uh, this is one of the example final global field distribution, uh, global Higgs VAB distribution. So it's indeed localized near the critical point. So most of the Hubble patches at the time of reheating will have Higgs VAB around 20 MeV, independent on the initial condition. Okay. So here, width of the phi is always Planckian, as I said, but the width of the Higgs VAB is translated from this Planckian width by some model parameters. And it can be very narrow or somewhat broad depending on some parameter called G. Okay. All right, so this is the essential mechanism. Then I'm gonna talk about naturalness in this one slide. So we have said that a uh, very small weak scale close to some critical point can be achieved somewhat uh, independent on the uh, initial condition, but that actually does not solve the hierarchy problem between the weak and Planck scale. So one of the necessary condition for the mechanism was that relaxion potential height has to be much, much smaller than the cutoff scale of a relaxion theory, M, but that's quantum unstable. For example, due to this kind of tadpole diagram, phi, potential gets a contribution of order m square. Higgs loop is sensitive to the highest scale, which is the m, right? So this kind of quantum correction makes the lambda phi close to m. So this consistency condition is quantum unstable. So we still need some fine tuning between the lambda phi and m, right? It can be thought of as a little hierarchy problem, but anyway, the total hierarchy problem is not completely solved. So again, Hubble selection of criticality can work well. So we can explain why the weak scale is close to some critical point, in our case, QCD critical point. Then that explains the 246 GeV, but that explanation requires some little hierarchy between two dimensional parameters uh, in the theory. Scale hierarchy, usual weak and Planck scale hierarchy, or lambda phi and m scale hierarchy can be translated to other fine tuning problems in our setup, other dimensionless parameter of fine tuning problems. So that could open up a new avenue for the scale hierarchy problem. All right, so let me summarize. So we have thought about is our universe a result of self-organized criticality? So we, we had to uh, question and answer two things. First, what quantum critical points is relevant to the Higgs VAB? And we have explored the QCD quantum critical points and calculated their roles for the weak scale of criticality. But we have made a lot of assumptions, three life flavors and just linear sigma model. More dedicated studies are needed to verify. But already the existence of such a uh, coexisting vacuum solution is interesting. It has never been studied before. And how can we realize the self-organized criticality, right? And one way is to use the quantum inflationary cosmology with Hubble selection. And that has been developed recently by Judice et al. and Justin Curie et al. We realized those mechanisms. But natural selection is still challenging. So a lot of uh, new ideas and research has to be done along this direction. So yeah, this is all I have prepared. Thank you. I'll take questions. Thank you for nice seminars. So are there any questions?
yeah, I guess a lot of different materials are involved and I'm also new to many different areas. So I welcome any criticism or comment or new ideas too. Um, so as yeah. far as I understand, the Hubble selection is due to um, the um, larger expansion rate. That's right. With the larger Hubble parameter. That's right. That's why it's so, called Hubble selection. Right. So whatever field contribute to the Hubble, um, and if the um, the um, additional contribution to the Hubble is positive, then that is um, more probable. Oh, that's the, right. That's right. Okay, so that's the Hubble selection. That's right. That's All right. right. That's right. Um, uh, the, the question is, um, okay, so you, you assume the lambda QCD scale is still close to the electroweak scale mm -hmm. in your argument. <laughs> Um, but in, in nature, it, we know uh, they are actually um, three orders difference. Ah, ah okay. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. So you, you don't mind that much. Um, so know. they could be thought of as a little hierarchy problem. Right. Okay. Okay. Not a little hierarchy problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. And okay. at the end of the inflation, the Higgs valve is still around lambda QCD. So mm -hmm. it has to make up the three orders of magnitude after mm -hmm. inflation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's a fine tuning, but absolutely possible. Right, okay. We, uh, we can't hear your voice. Ah. Ah, 이재식 교수님 소리가 안 들립니다. 소리가 안 들립니다. 어, 왜안 들리지? 마이크는 켜셨는데, 어. 소리가 안 들리는데 그 채팅 윈도우에다 질문을 쓰실래요? 마이크가 작동 안 하는 것 같아요. 아, ah, that's a very good question. Ah, we are actually thinking about variogenesis, but not the electroweak variogenesis. Um, so by electroweak gen electroweak variogenesis, maybe you mean utilizing the first order electroweak phase transition, right? But in our setup, we do not touch electroweak phase transition at all. Uh, actually. A smooth crossover of the electroweak phase transition could be one motivation for our work. So if the electroweak phase transition were strongly first order, the Higgs valve equal to zero could be a strong attractor of the, uh, this critical behavior. But if it's a second order, it's a smooth crossover. So that will not provide a sharp selection rule. So we need a new critical point near the weak scale so that could be the QCD point. Yeah. But if it's a strong first order, zero could be the uh, uh, relevant critical behavior in this work. So how important is the first order phase transition? How important? Ah, yeah. that's a good question. We haven't actually addressed 
uh, how bad the second order phase transition, but yeah, just naively, yeah, if we second order energy just changes smoothly, so we have a much broader distribution. Right. Yeah. But still, you, you have a picked position. Yeah, we have a picked position, but width will be broader. Broader. Okay. Yeah, but that, that's a good question. How can we quantify? Yeah, in, indeed, I, I was thinking of the Higgs inflation. Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of Higgs inflation, uh, we select the patch where the Higgs valve, Higgs, um, I mean, the Higgs potential is higher. Mm -hmm. Then due to the shape of Higgs potential, at the end of the day, Higgs rolls down to uh, lower energy in any case. Mm -hmm. So we, we already know the electroweak um, um, vacuum in the Higgs potential mm -hmm. in within the standard model. Mm -hmm. Probably um, this Higgs criticality is ah. already uh, realized in Higgs inflation model. That's right. So that's one example Judith et al. discussed in their paper. Oh, is it right? Okay. Yeah. So we have a two vacuum. One is weak scale. The other is the Planck scale. Mm -hmm. So as a function of renormalization scale, we have some critical behavior. Mm -hmm. so utilizing this Hubble selection mechanism, some Higgs valve has to be near that renormalization scale, which have degenerate vacuum. Mm -hmm. But their IG calculation shows that it cannot explain the full hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Can I have a very nice question? Yeah, sure. You, I think you did mention about the inflation scale. Inflation if, scale. Ah. If we consider the very low energy inflation scale, then this can work, this mechanism can work or not? Uh, it needs very low Hubble scale. It has ah. to be at least smaller than ah. lambda QCD. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if it's larger than lambda QCD or the uh, critical point of the Higgs lab, Higgs field will also experience large fluctuations, roughly speaking. Okay. Yeah, then our consideration became, becomes very complicated. So what's the associated um, temperature, reheating temperature for this? Ooh, if, um, there's no uh, necessary consequence. Um, it, it could, I'm just worrying about BBN. BBN, ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it could be anything, I think. Reheating temperature, yeah, mm -hmm. just depends on the reheating sector. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as uh, reheating temperature and finite temperature effects doesn't ruin um, this phase space structure too much, then at the time of the reheating, most Hubble patches will reside here and it will roll down and Higgs field will roll down to the uh, today's vacuum. But if finite temperature disturbs this behavior and somehow the scenario can change. But temperature itself can be high enough. Yeah, it's just almost free parameter, I think. Yeah, the upper bound of the reaching temperature is set by the Hubble. Oh. Right, you, you cannot make more energy from the oh. lower energy. Oh, I see, I see, that's right, that's right. So reaching yeah. temperature need to be um, smaller than a certain value, I guess I less than lambda QCD in your case. That's right, that's right. No, 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 reheat temperature is, you know, the Usually temperature is uh, squared of ah, H times H. Huh? Yeah, that's right. H is square and Planck square. Yeah. Yeah, square root of H. So T uh, is, should be smaller yeah. than H, square root of H times M Planck. Ah, right, right. It's yeah, high. Right, right, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah that's right. Okay. Right. Thanks. So in this scenario, it's about uh, below probably 10 to 10, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that sounds interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So is there any more questions? Okay, okay. If not, uh, thank you for that seminar again. Okay, so it's, it's the, the end of the today's seminar. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you for all the questions and discussions. See you soon. <laughs> yep, see you soon too. Yes,